listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Good morning, Overwatch League fans. This is your Overwatch League Daily episode for January 21st, 2018. Today, I'm joined by Genome, an Overwatch caster and analyst for the Australia region. But first, let's take a look at last night's scores. For the first match of the evening, we saw Soon in the LA Valiant take on Profit and the London Spitfire. The Valiant were recently taken down a peg after losing to the Excelsior on Thursday, but looked to make a strong comeback against undefeated London. The Spitfire got out to a quick 2-0 lead at halftime, but the Valiant would battle back to take a decisive victory on Oasis and Eichenwald. This forced a Game 5 tiebreaker on Li Zhang Tower. Despite winning on control earlier, Los Angeles was unable to keep pace with Birdring on his Widowmaker and Genji and Profit on his in the end, London walks away with the victory, but the Valiant put up a strong performance. London wins three maps to two. For the next match of the evening, we saw the NYXL take on the Gladiators. New York decided to switch it up, playing Pine on Dorado instead of Sabiolbi, who previously had only played on control maps in the regular season. In the end, this one was all NYXL as the Gladiators would fall four maps to zero. In this week's final match, the Boston Uprising take on the San Francisco Shock. Both teams have shown some form of brilliance early on in the preseason or regular season, but neither have been able to perform against top teams. This series went back and fourth and left us tied after four games. In the tiebreaker, both teams went the distance as we got to see all three rounds. In the end, the San Francisco Shock would win this one three maps to two. At the end of two weeks, we've got the Dynasty, Excelsior, and Spitfire, all with a 4-0 record. We've got five teams in the middle at 2-2, two and two, the Boston Uprising and Florida Mayhem at 1-3, and three, and then the Dallas Fuel and Shanghai Dragons in last at 0-4. Genome, thanks so much for joining me on today's show to discuss yesterday's matches. Let's talk about the Spitfire and the Valiant first. We saw the NYXL 3-0 the Valiant earlier this week. What does this match tell us about where the Valiant rank competitively? So sadly, we're going to have to wait until week five of the first stage until we get the last piece of this puzzle. And that's when New York XL goes up against London Spitfire. We've already had the other two matchups, and if we were to just draw the easy conclusion from that, it would be that XL's at the top, Spitfire's a bit behind them, and then LA Valley in a third, close on the heels of London Spitfire. However, I don't think that's how it's going to shake out. I think we're going to see a bit of a rock, paper, scissors thing come through here. And the reason for that is because of how the DPS of London Spitfire are going to be able to deal a lot better with the threat of Jonark. Now, we know that Jonark has been just this crazy, amazing DPS output zen so far. But I think when you've got such an outlier stat like that, when he's doing, you know, truly DPS levels of damage and out damaging, you know, both his own DPS players and the, the ones on the other team. When it's that much of an outlier, I think it's, you've got to look at both sides of the coin. That means, yes, Jonak is playing an amazing Zen, but it also means that the other team is to some extent allowing him to do that. Bird Ring and Profit, however, aren't going to let him get away with that. They are a badass Bonnie and Clyde duo, and they're going to be up in the back lines causing all sorts of problems for Jonak. Now, I'm focusing on these three because I think this is quite solidly the two to four range in the Overwatch League. I think Soul Dynasty at the moment are clearly on the top. There's a big pack in the middle, and even though the Los Angeles Valiant are on two and two at the moment, they definitely don't belong there. And if you want to know why that is, well... They had a solid showing against the Spitfire. They dismantled Dallas. They stopped the shock. And that's why I think it's fair to say they're fourth. Well, yes, all three of the Korean teams have looked nigh untouchable up until now. But today, the Valiant showed even a God King can bleed, right? And I definitely don't want to take away too much credit from the Valiant because I think they did a really good job of identifying some weaknesses in Spitfire uh, and exploiting those. I don't want to dismiss those efforts and just say that you know, it was a mistake by the Spitfire. No, the Valiant have a fantastic dive mechanism. The way they do it is fantastic. And the big chink in the armor they really found today was aggressive McCree play. And it was interesting that it wasn't just one hero, right? We saw 
both Rascal, who definitely was the, the poorer of the two, but also Birdring on his McCree, start trying to be really aggressive and get punished for it. Both the McCrees wanted to play towards the front of their compositions, you know, be within flashbang range, be doing the extra damage. Of course, McCree's not that long range hero like Soldier. He can't stand at the back and, and still have a reasonable damage output because his damage fall off is a lot worse. But time and time again, especially on Horizon, we saw the Diva, the Winston, and the, the Tracer, I think it was, of Soon just come in and blow him up in a half a second. And by the time Spitfire really worked this out, and it was almost at the end of Eichenwald, I think, where you saw Birdring start to play a little bit more passively, play back with Bedosin, the Zen Yada. Um, at that point, it was too late. Valiant had a bunch of ultimates, they wiped them out, and they didn't really get another chance to use that. And the other question has to be asked, if you're going to be playing that far back, if, you, if, you're, if they're forcing you that far back, then you should just be on Soldier, because he is much more effective from that range. No, he doesn't have the Deadeye, and the Deadeye is a big part of why McCree is getting picked in this meta, because Mercy is so strong, and Deadeye is so adept at taking her out while she's flying way high up in the sky, and she doesn't really have time to drop down to safety before the Deadeye goes off. The Tac Visor isn't quite as good um, at punishing Mercies who, who do that in their Valkyrie ultimate, but it's still pretty good. And if you're getting dived that much, it's probably going to be the more effective pick overall. Rascal has been kind of in a weird spot for the London Spitfire. Where, based on how we've seen him be played, what can we really take away from that going into uh, the rest of the season? Rascal has not looked like the player that we knew when he was playing for Kongdu Panthera in the Apex tournament so far in Overwatch League. Even though London have a 12-man roster, which means that he's always going to be getting scrims, he's not the awkward seventh man out who has to sit there and just coach or watch his teammates play and wait to be subbed in every once in a while. They've got 12 people to play with. He is always, or she should always, be sharp. And yet every time we've seen him so far this season, both maps he played today, and I think he played one map uh, earlier in the week as well, he's looked confounded he's looked out of place and he has not looked like his old self the more perplexing thing is why they've been subbing him in when you look at the heroes he's been running so he's been running exactly the same heroes as birdring or prophet could have played anyway soldier genji a bit of mccree some junk rat and as far as i can tell so far you'd be better off having both prophet and birdering on most of those heroes so what does that leave him with? Well, he's got a couple of odd heroes in his hero pool. He does play Sombra, Doomfist, and May. All of these are pretty off meta picks, and unfortunately they don't work particularly well with the maps that are currently in the map pool. Now, sure, we've seen Ru Jae Hong bring out May on Junkertown attack, but that's not exactly an orthodox strategy, and it's not something that I would expect Spitfire to bring out anytime soon. May's much more at home on maps like King's Row, where she can block up the streets phase, and the good thing about him being able to play those you know, more meta heroes like Genji or Soldier is that when you get to the other parts of the map when these off meta picks aren't as good, he can switch over and be more of a consistent DPS at that point. But because these heroes are so niche, I think it really is just going to come down to the map. So you might want the May on King's Row. You might want the Sombra on Temple of Anubis, possibly False Guy Industries, and the Doomfist. Well, we do actually see that every now and then on Horizon, but he hasn't bought that pick out yet. The stage one, the maps are going to stay the same, and I think Birdring and Prophet really just need to be the go-to pair. I think there is a place for Rascal on Horizon at the moment, but only if they change strategies, only if they start going with, uh, you know, the Doomfist on either attack or defense, and possibly Sombra for attack. Otherwise, he just seems like a budget version of Prophet and Birdring. Those two are obviously getting more practice time together, and you can really tell, even in the couple of games that they have had already, they are starting to become a fearsome duo. And just the way that they they dance around each other in the back lines, taking down supports. You really saw on Dorado, um, 
something I've mostly noticed in tanks before. The tanks will rotate onto the cart to keep each other healthy and make sure that they both don't go down at the same time. And in the same sort of way, you're seeing Bird Ring and Rascal rotate through harassing the opposition support players so that they are never in a position to focus 100% on actually healing and supporting their team. So the New York Excelsior have been fairly consistent with the compositions they've been giving us for the regular season. We've seen a pine on control, and then we've seen Sabiolbi and Libero for the rest. But today they switched something up. They brought in pine on Dorado. How did you feel about that change there? So if you're not familiar with pine's history, he was one of the OG TF2 sniper players, and that's like totally transferred over to overwatch that skill set because i feel like that's one of the things that they won't talk about on the broadcast like they seem to be a bit sketchy about mentioning other games um so that's a bit about his history uh now we saw him play a lot of mccree so far on the control maps where he has been subbed in but i think he's actually the most comfortable on the Widowmaker, and that's why you see him come out and have such a stellar defense on dorado i mean he he absolutely destroyed them. He ran circles around them. We saw that part where he was just grappling everywhere. It took them like 10, 15 seconds to actually hunt him down in the end. And by then, they'd lost the rest of the fight because they'd, they'd spent too many resources just trying to chase him around. So, yeah, look, the proof's in the pudding for this one, isn't it? It was a great choice to sub him in. They, I think from memory, they, like, they full held. And when I say full held on an escort map, that means they didn't even let them get one point. So moving forward, I think any place they can find where Pine can be such an asset for them on the Widow, I think it's fine to sub him out for one of the other two. To talk about his McCree a bit more generally, especially on the control points, it's actually very exploitable. So he's such a threat because he's hitting so many headshots and just has such high accuracy with the peacekeeper that he's making a lot of it work but just like we talked about in spitfire versus valiant it's so easy to dive on a mccree and blow them up and the flanks that he's going on um the fact that he's so far away from his team often means he's almost impossible to peel for and once the other team starts you know i feel like it, it almost needs to be a bit like league of legends or something right where you're like oh pine's missing and then everyone's like okay stop let's like just look around the corner find him kill him together and then go deal with the rest of the team because at the moment it's it's like that right he's like this jungler or something who's like coming out of the middle and surprising them i mean i don't know anything about league of legends but it's it's something like that right they just need to find him when he's alone and then go for him as a team because at the moment he's finding like the tracer the mercy that sort of thing by themselves and once that stops happening once these guys start sticking together and not getting caught off guard by him it's going to be a lot easier to deal with him something that was really interesting in this match was the length of the fights that we were seeing between the excelsior and the valiant well at least the length of time People were shooting at each other. At the end of the day, though, NYXL were coming up on top more often than not. Where did you see the Gladiators fall short there? So this would definitely have to be one of my most stinging criticisms of the Gladiators. They were often just far too hesitant to get into fights. And I know the fights may have seemed like they went on for a long time, but I think the actual, like, in-combat time wasn't necessarily as long. It was just how long the gladiators took to get onto points, how, how much they staggered, because... It felt like they were trying to search for info. So like on Horizon, I'm remembering, they poke in one entrance, then they look at a second, and then a third. But this whole time, the New York XL, they're getting this information as well. But the difference is when they're poking out, because they have this like higher individual skill, you're seeing the Tracer players like Sabi Olby get kills because he's poking out, finding one of the Gladiators members who's just poking around by themselves looking for that info and winning the duel. And then all of a sudden, you've just got to wait the 20 seconds. You've got to wait for them to respawn and come back. And by that point, um, you know, they're just bleeding time off the clock. So this was a two-way street. The XL were getting the info just as much as the Gladiators were, and that allowed them to set up for the defense just as much as the Gladiators were trying to form themselves up going into the points. This is where I'm going to draw the distinction between patience and hesitation. Patience is where you're waiting for that opportunity to go in, and hesitation 
is when you should have a plan already, uh, but you're trying to make it up on the fly. And this is why I think teams need to have what I'm going to call like a default. It's kind of a term I've brought across from CS where there's just a standard thing that that team does in a certain situation on a particular map, and it's tailored for that map. Now, in Overwatch, a default might be like, okay, we don't really know how the enemy's set up here, and regardless of like whether we get some info to change that, um, our first push is just going to be like up the top of Horizon through the right side, and then if they're set up differently, like we'll adjust it the next time we go in. And you just modify that slightly if it fails, and you keep trying to you know get a better read on how the the defense is setting up until you can finally crack it. Because in the amount of time that they spent outside point B on Horizon, the Gladiators could have got an entire another fight in the amount of times they got just one person staggered and had to wait again the amount of time they took making that decision of which way they wanted to push they could have had a whole nother attempt at it so let's go ahead and talk about the san francisco shock versus the boston uprising something that i've seen thrown around a lot about the san francisco shock and their strengths and weaknesses is that they rely too much on baby bay do you think that's true I don't think San Francisco shock at that one dimensional that they're, you know, really just relying on Baby Bay to make a play. And if he doesn't, that's it. They're done. The deciding map on Li Zhang Tao today was proof of that. Uh, but we can talk more about Dante later. Um, their tanks and supports, I think they've, they're really all playing their part. Nomi does a fantastic job. I think Duck is one of the better mercies in in Overwatch League, especially compared to where San Francisco Shock are on the ladder, I think uh, Dark actually plays above his pay grade a little bit there. Everyone was feeling very excited about Baby Bay's performances, especially after the preseason, and I don't think he's been quite as impactful when we've seen him play in the, the actual regular season matches, but I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of that from the preseason hasn't there. It was it was a fun, you know, there were some fun show matches. We got to see some weird, wacky compositions. We got to see a lot of people who probably aren't going to get a lot of playtime for the rest of Overwatch League this year. Um, and as a result, I think our expectations did get a little skewed by that. If we're talking more about the pharmacy combo specifically then obviously yeah they do dedicate a lot of resources to having a mercy on him at all times but you have to in the farah v farah battle you know it's it's a three rocket versus two direct hit situation if you're not getting pocketed um that's how hard it is for the other farah to win that they've got to hit three in a row whilst dodging you um so i don't think that's really viable and Every time you go to fire around, you really do want to stick that mercy with them. So in that case, I think it's definitely viable and, and appropriate to dedicate that many resources to Baby Bay. Ultimately, this match was decided in five maps and three rounds on the last one on Li Zhang Tower. What gave the shock the edge here to eke this one out? How cool was that decider on Li Zhang Tower? <laughs> It was so much fun to watch, and there were a bunch of really important moments throughout it that decided that, I mean, just Dante in general, uh, especially though on the third point on Garden where Farrah's usually dominate, it was Dante that came out and stepped up to the plate. I mean, this was a guy who was playing like he wants to keep his spot when Sinatra comes back uh, and turns 18, right? Like, he knows that the tracer position is up for grabs. We we know how much Sinatra's getting played, uh, paid, and Dante is there just trying to make his case to stay as the starter and increase his value. Apart from that, there are another couple of really key moments that I'll just highlight quickly. Um, I think on Control Center, when Boston decided to use the tank composition with the Lucio, that allowed them to push up really far. Um, and take the fight wherever they wanted to, to take it, right? Because they have that Lucio boost, they had the choice. But instead of taking it at like one of the, the better chokes, they tried to push up and catch them in the initial lobby area where the mega health is, and they didn't quite time it right. And so it just didn't work, uh, and they ended up losing that. You also had Kalios's grav on control center, which was really not the best i mean he you saw his eyes light up he was like oh there's so many of them there's a valkyrie mercy like yeah let's get it but then they didn't have the follow-up he grabbed them all the way up the top and 
you know, his team just couldn't do the requisite damage to, to punish them from there. Neko's boops on Night Market were also a lot of fun. And I think overall, you know, San Francisco Shock, they just pulled out a couple of really clutch plays that allowed them to push through and, and take that series. And I think, you know, it's going to be one of those ones that decides, you know, who could make top six possibly at the end of this. Either of these guys have a chance. It probably, you know, games like this, that's what you have to win to get yourself over the line. For this match, there was some expectation that Boston was favored here against the Shock. The analysts were saying it on the desks. The casters were mentioning it. uh, The Pickums were all favoring Boston here. Was this game a true upset, or do you think that we were just kind of misreading the strengths of these teams? So I tend to think of an upset as when a team beats someone who is generally considered to be much better than them. And I don't think that was the case here. I think Boston and Shock are pretty much in the same ballpark. And so, you know, if one has, you know, a 40% chance to win and the other has a 60% chance to win, like, would you call that an upset? I, I don't think so. I think that's just, you know, two teams who have a reasonable chance to win and, and one's better than the other one. So I'm not going to sit here and like wag my finger at anyone who said it's an upset. They might just be using that term slightly different to how I would. I think it was definitely the correct sort of analysis to say that Boston were the most likely team to win, just looking at the past results and how they'd performed. Um, But, you know, shock was always in this and it was good to see them come out with a win and especially uh, with such a hype finish. I always got to love those 3-2 games. My thanks to Genome for stopping by on the show today. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at GenomeGG. On Wednesday's episode, I'm going to be joined by Yiska. We're going to go ahead and preview some of the matches for this next week. Remember, you can follow the show on all of your favorite podcast outlets, including iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, Google Podcast. We're everywhere. Or you can just watch or listen to us at the front on the front page of winstonslab.com. If you like the show and want to support it, head on over to patreon.com slash OWL daily show. Find out where and how you can get involved. We're on YouTube too. Click on the link in the show notes to find us. And if you want to stay in touch, email me at overwatchleaguedaily at gmail.com. Tweet me at OWL daily show or join our discord at discord.me slash OWL daily show. With that, Another week of Overwatch League Daily is in the books. I'll be back on Wednesday with Yiska for another one.